Welcome to our line by line study of the book of Acts. This is our 50th study. Today we are covering chapter 20 verses 1 through 12. And that's about two thirds of the way through the book of Acts. And I need to give you a warning before this study starts. And it's a very important warning. In this passage, while Paul is preaching longer than he should, which is a message to us pastors to shorten things up. We can't get everything into one message anyway. A man falls out of a window, falls asleep and falls out of a window and dies. Paul brings him back to life. Spoiler alert for a passage. But this is a lesson that you don't want to fall asleep on. OK, so don't fall asleep when we're talking about people falling asleep. Just just look at do this now. I realize not everybody's going to be able to do this, but but look at me and don't look at the screen. Just look at me. Can you tell my eyes are closed? I can tell your eyes are closed, too, when that happens. All right. I just want you to know now. Now look at me again and tell me if you could tell I'm asleep. Now, I wish that didn't happen, but it does. Slack jaw, head back, all out. At the, at the West Campus one time, a guy started snoring. He's in the front row. If you're going to sleep, I suggest back there, up in the balcony, all the way in the back. But the front row, and he's snoring. And I finally had to say, can you, can you nudge him? I'm, I, I'm, I can't preach while he's snoring. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. So she nudged me. He's like, oh, yeah, oh, sorry, sorry. No problem. No problem. Listen. I understand people are tired. I understand a lot goes on. I understand you might have had something late last night and you wanted to be here in church. I understand all that. All right. So there is grace with it. So I'm joking to some degree, but you should come to church as awake as you can be. All right. When, when there's not some kind of emergency happens, come ready to receive it, to soak in the word of God, because it's incredibly important. Now, the title of our message and get this for a message I tell you not to sleep in. Listen to the, the topic we're covering. And I told you already, don't sleep. The title of our message is details of Paul's missionary journey. So today we're going to dive into details about where Paul went, when he went, why he went, which is not the most exciting passages. But at the end, we find something exciting that should perk us up. As I said, spoiler alert. Now, the subtitle to this message is proof you can trust the Bible. We're looking at details written by Luke in the book of Acts, an eyewitness account and a traveling companion of Paul. And these details lend to evidence that Luke was an eyewitness writing to eyewitnesses. The, uh, years ago, uh, like in the early 1900s, there was an attack against the Old Testament. And it was by a, a group called the School of Higher Critics. And I don't think they really spent time looking into what the Bible actually said. I think that they just kind of came up with their arguments. One of the arguments they would use is that the, 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 uh, the history of the Old Testament was written by Bronze Age goat herders. Now that's echoed by YouTubers and people on TikTok. Not that I go on to TikTok, but YouTubers and people on TikTok. I'm a boomer. Boomers don't go to TikTok, all right? But maybe, maybe, maybe we should. I don't know. Um, but, um, you know, Bronze Age goat herders. And so what's the deal with that? So you think that some Bronze Age goat herder wrote the books in the, the history books in the Old Testament. Well, Moses was the Bronze Age and Moses was a goat herder for 40 years. So they're accurate. But what they leave out was he was trained in all the knowledge and wisdom of Egypt from the time he was one until he was 40. And so if anybody was able to write, it was someone trained in Egypt to be able to write the Pentateuch and, 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 and the other history books were by people who could write them. It's not like God just called a goat herder, wasn't educated. I'm going to have you write the book of 1 Samuel. Samuel was raised up in the, in the, in the temple. He knew the things of God and he writes 1 and 2 Samuel. Uh, and they, they, they are full of details. And when you get down to the details, the details are strong evidence that it's true. Because it's talking about where they moved. They went from here. They went to there. They had a conflict with this, uh, with this uh, the Moabites. They had a conflict with the Ninevites, um, with the Babylonians. And we see that these conflicts happened. There's external evidence for the Bible. By external, I mean they discover something in archaeology. There's another historical record that is found and it tells the same story. So there's external evidence to these historical books in the Old Testament. We have the Moabite stone, which was found where the Moabites lived, telling the same account 
that the Bible tells about a battle with the Moabites. From their perspective, we have the Sennacherib cylinder. Look this up sometime, it's amazing. It's, it's Sennacherib bragging about taking Israel. And in the Bible, it says that Sennacherib came and took Israel. Remember, Israel's divided now between Israel and Judah. They're a divided nation. And so they take Israel. Then they attack Judah. And when they attack Judah, they take the villages of Judah. But the people of both Israel and Judah pour into Jerusalem. The walls are expanded during those times. And Hezekiah and Isaiah call out to God and ask for help. And Sennacherib can't take Jerusalem. Now, that's thought to be made up wholesale. Why the children of Israel are in Babylon, they make this up wholesale. It's not, it's not history. Then they find the Sennacherib cylinder and Sennacherib, who is the, the commander, the, 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 the king, he's bragging in the cylinder. And he says, I took the cities of Israel and the villages of Judah, but Jerusalem I could not, I, but Jerusalem I did not take. He didn't say I could not. He's bragging, right? So he says, I didn't take it as if he left it behind. Like there's Jerusalem and we just left it there. That's external evidence. Now from another source, which is extremely important in scholarship. If you have a, a similar source, then they could be colluded. But when they are separate sources, like from the king of Nineveh, a, a cylinder written by him, bragging about what he did, and then the Bible, now you go, these things are history. So today, there, there, there are not scholars who believe that the Old Testament is made up wholesale. There are some who believe that parts of it are made up, for sure. I'm not going to speak for all scholarship, right? But we know solidly that it's made up of real history that happened. Doesn't mean that they believe all the stories or accounts or miracles are true, but it does mean that they know that the heart of these messages are true. Now also, when we... Um, when we get into the, the rest of the Bible, understanding that there is internal evidence as well. Internal evidence is when you look at a passage like Acts, and Acts is particularly under attack today. There are, there are a lot of people who are attacking whether or not Acts was history, whether or not Luke was the traveling companion of, of Paul. And so they attack, they attack it. Well, when you dive into the book of Acts, what do you find? What is the writing like in, in Greek? What ye, we can tell what years it was written in. By, by the kind of Greek that it was. We could tell, him, tell what kind of a scholar he was by the writing. And Luke has some of the finest writings that there are. And Luke, again, is full of details. The details are so accurate that critics say that Luke wasn't a traveling companion of Paul. He just got Paul's letters and he got Josephus' writings and some other historians. And then he went and put together all of these pieces to make it look like he was a traveling companion and got the details right. Well, tell me, what seems more realistic? That Luke was a traveling companion of Paul and was just telling you what happened? Or that he got Luke's letters and Josephus and said, I want to fake people out, so I'm going to add all these details in and, and make them right. When you look into it, you see as Paul wrote certain things, they are clear in the details in the book of Acts. Now, let me just say this before we move on, because we need to. I found my first crisis of faith when I was 16 years old, reading through the Bible, fairly new Christian, and I, and I was told that this is inerrant. The Bible is inerrant. You've heard that before, right? The Bible is inerrant. Well, what exactly does that mean? So what I thought it meant as a 16 year old was that somebody found a copy of the New Testament, probably with gold leaves and a ribbon, right? And they said, look, we got the word of God. It's inerrant. And so when people would attack it and say, Constantine in 300 took control of the scriptures and he added to them, then you would think, well, how do we disprove that? But what I discovered as I was making my way through Kings and Chronicles, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, I came across a, a passage that said that 47,000 men were killed in this battle. But in Kings, it had said 74. And at 16 years old, I was young enough to remember those numbers. And I went, some don't jive. And I went and I read, and it's the same account, but one says 74, one says 47. Now, this shook me because it's inerrant. And if somebody transposed the numbers, which is what I thought when I read it, that somebody transposed the numbers in Kings or in, in, in Chronicles. And so I went to my pastor, who was the Methodist pastor at that time. And he said, that's a different account. So I went home and I looked at it. The things that happened before it and during that account and after it is obviously the same account. 
that only deepened my crisis. Because now I found some, an error in something I was told didn't have any errors. And now I have a pastor telling me that it's a different account when obviously you go back and look at it and it is the same account. So what do scholars mean? What do, what do Christian scholars mean when they say the Bible is inerrant? They mean it's inerrant in the things that it teaches. Why? Because we didn't get the Bible floating down from heaven with a ribbon hanging off of it, with the music and a light shining on it. Whoa! We got it in a very earthy way. What do I mean by earthy? I mean that in the New Testament, let's just talk about that. New Testament, because that's where we're at. So New Testament, if I was a Christian in 125 and I wanted a Bible, copy of the Bible, I usually had to copy it myself. So I would borrow your copy of Matthew and I would write out my copy. Now, my copy of Matthew would not be as good as the copy that I got. I'll guarantee you that. Because a lot of times I'll just kind of, that's good enough, good enough, good enough, good enough. You may be incredible copying things down. You may be valedictorian of your class and you would make an almost perfect copy of that. Now we have today 5,000 5, surviving Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. Understand the power of that. If Constantine became a Christian as he did in 300 and had access to the scriptures and could change them, we would have no confidence if there was only three or four copies and he had control of them. That's what the critics say. He changed them, and so our Bible can't be trusted. But today we have 5,000 remaining copies. Imagine how many there were in 300 AD after Christianity had traveled into Europe and into Egypt and all around the world. And Christians had been making copies for hundreds of years for themselves. If he made changes in one manuscript, he'd have to gather all six, seven thousand, eight, whatever there were, and he had to make changes in all of them. So it becomes very powerful and trustworthy that it came to us in this way. Now, let me just give you this analogy quickly. Let's just say for the next five minutes, I'm going to say something. We passed out paper and pencil to everybody here. And you're going to write down, every one of you is going to write down what I say for the next five minutes. And you, and you write it down. Then we got several hundred people here. Then we gather all the papers together and they're all different. There's not one of them that doesn't have a mistake in it. Whoever you valedictorian are here, you're, you're almost perfect. He's made one mistake. You might have gotten behind. You put one word in front of another. That's a, that's a variant in the manuscript. That's a discrepancy. You might have put some, you know, di, you know, flipped letters around, 47 or 74. So now we can start comparing manuscripts. And, and we can see that very, the mistake I make, you're probably not going to make, but you are going to make a mistake. And the mistake you're going to make is probably not the same mistake they made. And so you're able to compare them and work out what was said. That's textual criticism. This is a science or an art by which we get back to the originals of Aristotle, Plato, Homer, other ancient writings. Let me read to you what the Britannica Dictionary says about textual criticism. This is the process by which we take manuscripts and get back to the original. Listen to what it says. Textual criticism is a branch of literary criticism and textual scholarship that aims to restore a written work to its original form. It involves studying the first formal documents of a work, authenticating them, and identifying their variants. That's what I discovered was a variant, 74,000, 47,000. That's a variant. The goal is to recover the text in its earliest form and preserve the original meaning. So you may hear me pray when I pray, Lord, your word is inerrant in the things that it teaches. And I explain to you guys how we got our Bible because I don't want some of you college students to get to college and have some professor tell you there's discrepancies in the Bible. And you go, no, it's inerrant because you don't understand the process of how we got it. So I was invited to speak at a class at U of A back in the early 90s. And um, I was going to speak about the Bible. When I got there, the professor said, this is Robert Furrows, the pastor of Calvary Tucson, and he's going to talk with you about the, the discrepancies in the scriptures. He didn't use the word variance. Discrepancies is a harsher word, right? The discrepancies in the scriptures. Well, variants are discrepancies. And so, when, when he, and he said thousands. He's going to talk to you about the thousands of discrepancies there are in the Bible. Now, he didn't tell me that's what I was going to talk on. So when I get up, I asked him, how many discrepancies do you think there are in the Bible? I asked the professor. He said, well, thousands. I said, there's hundreds of thousands. Because we have 5,000 Greek manuscripts, over 24,000 manuscripts in Coptic and Latin and other. And, and we have the New Testament writers 
who, I mean, oh, excuse me, we have early church fathers that quoted the Bible and we don't have the references they were quoting from, but we have their quotes that they wrote out and we can compare all these together and there are differences in all of them. And then I had to explain to them textual criticism and how we got the Bible. That crisis at 16, which shook my faith to the core, was helpful for me to be able to talk to this classroom of kids about how we get our Bible and I'm committed to sharing it with you because I don't want you to be shaken. I want you to know. It's, it's, it may be a little difficult to get our mind around how, the, how this works, but you know what? You're a big boy, big girl, right? You can get it. We can talk about these things and understand it. And that way we can know that we can trust what's here. Now, let's get to our text. Paul had given his itinerary earlier. Luke had wrote Paul's itinerary earlier in Acts 19, 21 and 22. Paul said after, after a great work was done in Ephesus that Paul was going to go to Macedonia, which is the northern part of Greece. So he's going to leave the lower part of Turkey in Ephesus and he's going to go to the upper part of Greece in Macedonia to Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. Then he's going to travel to Achaia, which is the lower part of Greece, which is Corinth. Then he wants to go to Jerusalem. So that's his plan. Now, what does the Bible say? We make our plans and God directs our path. So after Luke tells us about Paul's plans, we learn that his plans went a different way. That just like I'm taking a trip this week, I'm hoping that I don't have flights that get canceled and I don't end up for hours in an airport. Seems like it's happening more today than it ever has before, right? So Paul has some interruptions very, for various reasons. And we see he doesn't exactly do what he said. Now, critics will say, well, here it says he's going to do this, then he does something different. Well, you cannot hold the Bible to a different standard that you would hold here. Paul made plans, and just like all of us, our plans might change. And so Paul changed his plans. By the way, the Corinthians were upset Paul didn't go. And when you read the book of 2 Corinthians, you learn they're upset. And Paul says to them, I tell you the truth, I'm not lying. It was to your benefit that I didn't go. The church at Corinth was a dumpster fire of a church. Paul was going to have to go with a bunch of corrections. And Paul didn't want to do it at that point. He wanted to go back and write him 2 Corinthians in a loving, well thought out way. And so he says, I didn't want to go to you. He didn't want to go and be harsh with them face to face. So he skipped going to Corinth and they got offended. They were like, you said you were coming and then you didn't come. What's up with that? And so Paul has to write and tell them why he didn't go. So let's pick it up here. This is Acts 20 verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, this is the uproar that took place in the theater. Great is the goddess Diana. Remember that from our last study? And um, they, they shouted that for two, for two hours. Then they were settled down because the gospel had affected their pocketbook. <coughs> and so Paul called the disciples to himself. This is in Ephesus. Embraced them and departed to Macedonia. That's the first step of his plan. So he gets the Christians in Ephesus together, embraces them, says goodbye, and leaves for Macedonia, Thessalonica, Berea, Philippi. And it says, now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. And so Luke gives very quickly what he does there in the region of Macedonia. He encourages them with many words. And for Paul, it means many words as he interacted with them. And then it says, he came to Greece, which is the area of Athens, would be the, the ancient would be called Greece, and stayed there three months. So this is different than his plan. His plan was to go to Macedonia, then to Achaia, which is Corinth, and then to Jerusalem. But now he stops at Greece for three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, Syria, Antioch is in Syria. That was his sending church. And he decided to, re, um, to return through Macedonia. So Paul learns that there's a threat on his life, on the ship. And so he's not going to take the ship. His travel plans are, are changed because he's heard that somebody wants to kill him on there. So he turns around and returns to Macedonia. Instead of going to Corinth, he goes back up because there's a major port city called Troas that is across the Aegean Sea from Macedonia. And he could take a ship there because it's a major port all the way back around to Jerusalem. So his, his plans are changed. This is one independent record. And 1 Corinthians is another independent record. Paul writes about it 
and Acts writes about how it happened. Neither describe exactly what happened. Acts doesn't tell us why he didn't go to Corinth. To get that, we have to go to another source. That's Paul's letter. Here's what he says in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1, 23 and 24 to the Corinthians. Moreover, I call God as a witness against my soul that to spare you, I came not no more to Corinth. He says, to spare you, I didn't go. Now, again, as you develop this in Corinthians, you see that he's telling them, I didn't want to come with harsh words, but to spare you, I didn't come to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over your faith. He doesn't want to lord over them, but our fellow workers for your joy. For by faith you stand. So he wanted to go to them in joy and not with these difficulties that he writes about in Corinth, 2 Corinthians, which he does take care of. So this is the way that coincidences from different writers that seem to be disconnected fit together to give us evidence of what the Bible says. So we see this all over the place. We see it in the, in the Gospels. One Gospel tells us that John and James, two brothers, wanted to call fire down from heaven from a village that didn't receive him. They went into the village, they rejected Jesus, and leaving, James and John went to Jesus, said, let's call fire down from heaven. Another one of the Gospels, not the same one, says that Jesus nicknamed them the Sons of Thunder. Putting them both together, you see why. But they don't, neither gospel tells it. So these are independent works that come together to show us why something was the case that we can't get on their own. And I think it's funny, by the way, that Jesus called them the Sons of Thunder. It tells us he had a personality, that he was, that he was funny. He's like, hey guys, make sure the Sons of Thunder, the Sons of Thunders come along with us, get them. Don't leave them behind. He, he made fun of them for wanting to call fire down from heaven. So we see these kind of things everywhere. Now we get a list of the people that are with him. And I'm not gonna do it today because I don't have time, but you can cross-reference these people with the letters of Paul and you can see how they connect to even where they come from here. Luke tells us where they came from. Paul writes about them at the end of his letters and you can connect the truths between these two independent sources. So verse four, it says, and so Peter of Berea, accompanied him to Asia. Now he's the only one that's mentioned that we don't find anywhere else. So we don't know much about this guy. But Archelaus is mentioned five times in Paul's letters. So we know a little bit about him. And Secundus of the, of the Thessalonians. Secundus is a slave name. In order to make people slaves, you dehumanize them. The Romans were no different. And by the way, the Roman form of slavery, although bad, was not as bad as antebellum slavery. The antebellum slavery in the U.S. Was, was, was some of the worst slavery you could possibly have. They call it chattel slavery. It was some of the worst that you could possibly have. But they dehumanized them in Rome, even though it wasn't as bad. And they would have a name for the number one and a name for the number two slaves. You would have the, the prominent slave in your home and you would have a second slave. Secundus is the second slave. And so, they, so we, now we see a slave became a Christian. What do we know about the early church? We know that the very first Christians were mostly, and, and enemies of the church attacked the church in this way. This isn't something the church wrote about. These were the enemies. A saying of Christians in Rome, this is a religion of women. Remember, Rome looks down on women. The Bible elevated them, but Rome looked down on them. This is a religion of women, of slaves, and of weak men. It's the same thing they say today. Christianity is a crutch for the weak, right? It's the same thing we say today. So we know that, and, and by the way, today, more women come to Christ in greater numbers than men do. It's the same thing today, but in the early church, it was even heavier. I think because the gospel gave respect to women. Women followed Jesus around and provided for his needs. And the Bible tells us that. In a world that didn't value women the way that women are valued in our world today. So it's just seen Secundus here is a, a slave who's now with Paul. Then we have Gaius of Derby. Gaius is written about by John as well. We have Timothy. We don't need to talk about him because there's two letters written to him. We have Trachias and Trimophus of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. So now he goes to Macedonia, crosses the Aegean Sea. And these men are waiting at Troas when Paul gets there. But we sailed away from Philippi, that's in Macedonia, 
after the days of unleavened bread and in five days journey, but we, uh, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Now, if you remember, when they crossed from Troas to Philippi earlier in the book of Acts, it says that they had a good tailwind and they made it in a day. Now we're told it took them five days to make it back. Well, what do you find when you study the wind currents and traveling one way or another? That the wind is with you when you go to Philippi and it takes a lot to get around it and make it from Philippi to Troas. Just in sailing, the way you've got to tack and you've got to do it, it took them five days to get there and you find it that way. Again, this is just written out and when you go back and find it, if, if he didn't live through it, he would have had to do research to find out how long does it take to get from Troas to Philippi and from Philippi to Troas if the winds are with you or against you. Now in verse 7, now on the first day of the week, now they're in Troas, they're in Troas. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, notice they're, they're breaking bread on, sat, on Sunday, not on Saturday, this is communion. So for all of those who say that if you go to church on Sunday, you're taking the mark of the beast, so do Paul. It says, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. I've never preached until midnight, praise God. <laughs> we used to have New Year's Eve services, but that was after midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room that were gathered together. And so now Luke is telling you there was something that maybe caused him to fall asleep, okay? That, because there's a lot of lamps up there, the fumes from those lamps, okay? And it says, and in a window sat a certain young man by the name of Eutychus. And all we know of Eutychus is that he fell out of a window and died, fell asleep during a sermon of Paul, which will tell you, and Paul raises him from the dead, which will tell you, you couldn't get out of Paul's sermons by dying. Even if you died, <laughs> he'd bring you back to life and say, I got more to say to you. It says, who was sinking into a deep sleep. I love the way it's worded. So he's like looking at Paul and Paul's like, hey, hey, hey yeah, he's going through his thing. And Paul's fading off and, and getting smaller and smaller. And the words are just in the background. Maybe you're going to sleep right now as I say that. And then it says, um, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. So we're told that he died. But Paul went down, fell on him and embraced him and said, do not trouble yourself for his life is within him. This is the end of the missionary journeys. Paul will go from here, stop by Ephesus and meet the elders on the beach. And then he will go to Jerusalem where he will be arrested and held in captivity in Caesarea Maritime for two years before he's sent to Rome in captivity. And so God gives one last miracle of raising someone from the dead as if to say to us that we have the evidence that we have life after this, that this is not the end that God has power over death. And so this man who listened to Paul and fell asleep and died was brought back to life. Now it says that when he had come down, he broke, uh, uh, and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while. So they weren't even done yet. After um, Eutychus comes back to life, they talk a long while, even until daybreak. So it's like a giant slumber party. And he departed. And they brought the young man in alive and they were not a little comforted. Now, again, these details may seem like when you're reading through the book of Acts, it may seem like, why do I need to? And I can tell you, there's been many times I'm reading through Acts, I'll just skip over these details pretty quick. It's like, okay, okay, oh yeah, there's Eutychus falling out of the window. It's kind of going on. But these details give us evidence that the scriptures are trustworthy and that's what's really important about them. Works of fiction stay away from details. They tell you, I'm not gonna give you advice on how to lie, but I'm gonna tell you what people say. They tell you when you lie, keep your story short. Don't put a lot of details in because details get you caught. There's a lot of details in Luke. If you're writing it, you're not gonna put those details in because somebody's gonna check. How long does it take to get from Philippi to Troas? And is it faster to go from Troas to Philippi? All of a sudden you're gonna go, all these details line up and they speak of the historicity of Scripture. Now, that doesn't prove the miracles, right? But it proves the historicity. And if it's true, if it's true historically and it's true geographically, you can go back and see where these places are and where they went. 
and it's true prophetically because it tells the future in it, then the most important part, it can be trusted spiritually, which tells us how we can have eternal life. And it tells us of Christ that God planned to bring through Abraham to bless all nations. Stand with me, would you? And let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for this passage we've been able to look at today. We thank you for the, what, what we see here and how powerful it is for us to know that there are details in the Bible. It's not just this fantasy people made up wholesale, but details in the Gospels, details in Luke and Acts, details in the history books of the Old Testament, details in the letters from Paul. And Lord, that we can, we can look and compare and see that these things ring true. And Lord, we trust you. We thank you for your word, that you've shown us that it's trustworthy. We pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to live under that blessing. And we thank you for this. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.